Yo, what up to all my real niggas of all races, creeds, and colors? This is your boy, Real Nigga Magus9, coming at you with a little building session, as I like to call them, because, you know, the sharing of information is like adding materials to your ever growing mental house. So, you know, this little building session, as I said, is called The State of Things. Now, this title has a double meaning, as you'll see later in the video. But for right now, let's just talk about this mental house that everybody is constantly building on. Now, first off, not everybody has a mental house. Some people have mental mansions, some people have mental estates, and some people have mental countries. And then on the other side, some people have just mental apartments, some have one-room singles, and then some are just completely homeless. But everyone's mental abode, as it were, is a direct reflection of the state in which they reside. And for most people, that state is slavery and bondage. Now I know most people think slavery ended when Lincoln popped up, but in reality it just started to shape shift a little bit. From physical bondage into psychological, which is religious, linguistic, historical, cultural, and the big one, contractual slavery. Now before we go any further, we must get into what is called etymology. Etymology is the history and study of word origins. And before you can truly understand any type of information, you must understand the language it is being communicated in. For example, most people think that black means dark and white means light. But in actuality, black comes from the word blake or bleak or bleach, which means pale or blank. And white is the German word gwit, which is wheat. And as you know, wheat is brown. But both words in reality really mean just void of color. This is a part of the linguistic bondage or the slavery of words I mentioned earlier. In later videos, we'll go a lot deeper into the subject, but for right now, we'll just touch on it just briefly. Like black and white have come to mean something totally different in colloquial language, which is just everyday slang. Most words that people use today don't mean anything near what they think they mean. Especially in law terminology. For instance, the word driver in legal terms means a person who is paid to take someone back and forth along the highway. And a passenger is a person who pays the driver to take them. Now if you're not engaged in any commerce or business along the highway, you're not supposed to need a driver's license. Now the word color which means the appearance of as distinguished from that which is real. So black in legal terms is a color. And by calling yourself this, you're actually saying you're not real. Now another legal term, minority, means infant or one who is under the legal age of competency. And the definition of infant is lunatic or a person of unsound mind. So again, by using words and terms and not knowing the intended meaning, places you in sort of a prison where you become the warden and guard able to free yourself but not doing it because you don't know you're the prisoner you actually think you're in charge that is real slavery it's not placing your body in constraints it's your mind that's incarcerated another example of this are the words sport game and team now everyone knows a sport is just a game and in sports you have teams you know there's no I in team I do it for the love of the game. The sport is bigger than one person. This is stuff you hear people say all the time. And to be fair, sports or games do teach you things like how to work well with others and how to accept it when things don't go your way. But in actuality, the root meaning of sport and game is to divert the attention. And team means a pack of pulled or steered animals like horses or oxen. Now, when does someone need a diversion? when they're trying to do something they don't want you to know about. They put out so much crap to divert your attention. Sports, video games, TV shows, music, music TV, etc. that you have no idea what's really going on or where to start to get back on track. But getting back on track starts with the psyche or the mind. The root meaning of the word psyche means soul, spirit, or mind. And unless your soul and or mind is free, how can you truly ever be? The best slaves are the ones who don't know they're slaves. 
The ones who will never try to escape from a jail, they have no idea they're in. And that is the exact state most people reside in today. The word state means condition, status, or rank. And like most conditions or status, they can be changed for the better or worse. But let's focus on the better for right now. All that is needed to change one's condition or state of mind is just desire and effort. And it starts with knowing thyself. Now, I don't mean knowing what your favorite color is or what foods makes you sick or even what pisses you off. You need to know the why behind those things, the laws that govern them, so that you can start to manipulate situations instead of being manipulated by them. It just shouldn't be about the fact that you like or don't like someone. It should be about the reason behind these feelings. And in knowing the why, you can either change, adapt to, or move away from the situation for the better. Now I know that people think things happen for no reason, or some people think God is the why behind everything, but this is a part of the religious slavery, or just slavery in general I was talking about. The meaning of religion is to bind fast or quickly. It literally means to lock you up. I don't care what kind of religion you're into, Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, pimping. Oh yeah, and don't get it twisted, pimping is a religion. It's just that money is the God, and not some far off dude with a face you can't see. But they all leave you searching outside of yourself for God, when in actuality, you are God. Now with that being said, we're going to get into a little history of slavery, with that being the state of the world today. Have you ever asked yourself, what is slavery, or where did it come from? Well, the dictionary defines slavery as a person who is the legal property of another, or one who was forced into servitude of another. As well, there are many types of slavery to contend with, like chattel slavery, which is when people are treated as personal property and are bought and sold as commodities by other people. Then there's debt slavery or debt bondage, which is when someone pledges themselves or their labor against a loan or is imprisoned for a debt. Then there's contractual slavery, which is when someone is bound or obligated to another by reason of their signature or consent, and that's with or without their knowledge. Then there's forced labor, which is when an individual is forced to work against their will under threat of violence or other imprisonment with restrictions on their freedom. And then there's involuntary servitude, serfdom, human trafficking, and so on and so on. But where did the idea come from? This idea of forcing someone to work or be held against their will, where did it come from? When our base human instinct is supposed to be freedom. Well, the first writings on the subject, though it wasn't called slavery back then, is from the first civilization in human history known as the Sumerians, or the Sagiga, which literally means the dark-headed ones. Now, according to the Sagiga, or Sumerian cosmogony on Earth, which is the origin of life on Earth, when it's from the Sumerian tablets of creation, which incidentally gave birth to the Bible, Christianity, and all the other religions. Now, according to the tablets of creation, humans were created by extraterrestrials called the Anunnaki, who came here to mine gold for the dwindling atmosphere of their planet. And when the Anunnaki's arrived on planet Earth, or Tiamat as it was called back then, they found the work of gold mining too strenuous, so they decided to create a worker life form, similar to themselves, from their own DNA to mine the gold. After a time, the workers were set free and given knowledge and provisions to help them survive and evolve on this planet. Now for those of you not familiar with the Sumerians or the Anunnaki, I definitely would advise you to look at the Sumerian Anunnaki playlist on this channel or just YouTube in general and get informed. For this is the civilization where all religions and religious myths are derived. And that includes Jesus, the Noah and the Flood, angels, the Garden of Eden and the Tree of Life, the Virgin Mary, and it just goes on and on. But for now, let's get back to our topic of slavery. It is a concept that has been interwoven through our very being since the beginning of civilization. As slavery relies on a system of social stratification or class distinction for its viability. The Anunnaki for all intents and purposes would have been like gods to the created workers. 
And I would absolutely say that God or creator and worker is a definite class distinction. So, from the very first civilization known to man, whether their creation story is true or not, and there is much evidence to suggest that it is true, slavery or servitude has been bred into our psyche. Passing down the concept from the Sumerians to the so-called Egyptians or Africans, who bought and sold or captured hundreds of thousands to millions of their own people, as well as Caucasians and other races, which most of which were of the latter. Keeping it ongoing to the Greeks and Romans, the first civilizations of which were of so-called African descent, on to the Moors and Ottomans, whose militaries were a majority of captured people, Slavs from the Caucasus Mountains, which is where the word slave actually comes from, and who later became known as the Mamluks, meaning white or pale slave, one of Islam's greatest military powers. Now, just a quick note, Mamluks were also called Golems, and I really suggest that you watch The Lord of the Rings again. That movie is strictly about the conquest, the Christian conquest over the Moors. It's really, really breaking it off. I suggest you watch it. Also on this channel, you should check out They Were White and They Were Slaves and White Slavery, The Untold Story. Now, one of the main reasons slavery persisted for so long is because this is the best way to create mass amounts of wealth and power in the shortest amount of time, reaping 80 to 90% of the benefits of someone else's labor, except for expenses, and saving 100% of your own. Slavery is so deeply embedded into the world's culture that we constantly use words every day that mean slave and keep us in bondage. Have you ever asked yourself where the words husband and wife come from or what they actually mean? Or what about the word family? Have you ever wondered where that word came from or why it's so ingrained into our everyday speech? Well, for those of you who don't know, here we go. The etymology or root meaning of the word husband is house bond or house master. It is a word from feudal times when the lord of a particular land had a vassal or serf or land slave called a husband who was in charge and took care of a designated area and a certain group of land slaves called the famalus in Latin, or the family. That brings me to the next definition. The root meaning of family is the whole number of slaves under one master in a household establishment. The husband, or house bond, was like a foreman or warden of the household slaves, serfs, for the feudal landlord, which is where the term landlord comes from. Now, a great movie that shows this is Rob Roy, with Liam Neeson. Now the term wife just means woman and she was the house bond's concubine and not necessarily the mother of the family though she could have been. Now how many of you have ever said the Italian greeting or goodbye ciao? Well if you have you're actually saying I am your slave. Now this just goes to show you how ensconced the ideal of slavery is in our everyday lives and minds and there is no one who can free you except you. Now, as we continue on with the evolution of slavery, picking it up around January 1st, 1492, incidentally, which is why the new year is January 1st, when the Moors handed over power to the Europeans. The Europeans basically continued the existing system of chattel slavery set in place by the Moors the previous 800 years, using captured peoples from invasions and raids as commodities to help boost, and in many cases, create the economies of the different Christian kingdoms. Chattel or bondage slavery flourished from this time, being controlled by the royal and elite banking families of those times, onto the colonization of the Americas, creating immense wealth for the different colonizing monarchies, as well as the 13 colonies. Now leading up to the Civil War, tensions between North and South colonies became extremely high because by the mid 18th century, most northern states had abolished slavery, whereas most southern states were growing incessantly rich because of it. Not to mention, the central bankers were putting pressure on Lincoln to regain a foothold on the American economy since being kicked out by Andrew Jackson some years earlier. Now that is the real reason for the Civil War. The bankers understood that by controlling a country's money supply and keeping them in debt, you keep that country in debt obligation or debt slavery. They also understood that by pitting the North against the South in a war, 
would be a great way to create mass amounts of debt for both sides and regain control over America. But Lincoln was hip to their game and didn't borrow any money from the bankers, instead creating debt-free government-issued money called greenbacks, which helped the North win the war and helped strengthen the economy years after up until 1865 when they smoked Lincoln to stop the production of the greenback. Which brings us to the type of slavery we're in today. Contract slavery. Before Lincoln's death, when the southern states walked out of Congress on March 27, 1861, the quorum or number to conduct business under the Constitution was lost. The only votes that Congress could lawfully take under parliamentary law were those to set the time to reconvene, take a vote to get a quorum, and vote to adjourn and set a date, time, and place to reconvene. But Congress abandoned the House and Senate without setting a date to reconvene. Under parliamentary law of Congress, when this happened, Congress became Senadia without day. And thus, when Congress adjourned Senadia, it ceased to exist as a lawful deliberative body. And the only lawful constitutional power that could declare war was no longer lawful or in session. When the southern states seceded from the Union, they ceased to exist Senadia. And some state legislatures in the North also adjourned Senadia, meaning all the states which were parties to creating the Constitution ceased to exist. President Lincoln executed the first executive order written by any president on April 15, 1861, Executive Order No. 1, and the nation has been ruled by the president under executive order ever since. When Congress eventually did reconvene, it was reconvened under the military authority of the Commander-in-Chief and not the constitutional law placing the American people under martial rule ever since. Now, since there was no more lawful government and no more legal physical slavery, the next best thing to do was to create a corporation out of the government so that it could be run properly. The one problem was that a corporation couldn't have any authority over or contract with a sovereign, which is we the people, unless the sovereign initiates it or consents to it. Now, enter Article 1, Section 10, Clause 1, and the 14th Amendment to the Constitution. The bankers saw a flaw in the Constitution that would allow them to re-implement slavery. The right to contract. Article 1 states, No state shall pass any law impairing the obligation of contracts. And the 14th Amendment states, All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state in which they reside. And also, no state shall deny to any person within this jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Now let's go back over that one more time quickly. It states, all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof. It doesn't state are subject to the jurisdiction thereof. That's very important to remember. Because what the 14th Amendment did was create a corporate subject citizen with no sovereign authority, able to be acted upon and ruled through its consent of contract. This corporate person, called a straw man, that was created by the 14th Amendment, is the all capital letters name identical to yours that you get every day through a bill, driver's license, social security card, passport, etc. Also around this time, a major court ruling reclassified corporations as persons, giving them all the rights thereof except the right to vote or hold office. Now, after a couple of U.S. corporate government bankruptcies, the result of which were the loss of the people's gold and land to the central bankers from whom they borrowed the money, the corporate government had nothing left to pledge when it happened a third time in the Depression of 1929 except for its corporate slave citizens. One main reason for the creation of the Federal Reserve, or just shall we call it by its true name, the Federal Reserve Association, a religious nonprofit Delaware corporation, file number 0042817, was to place and keep America in debtor status to ensure control over its people. Now in a letter from Edward Mandel House, foreign policy advisor to President Woodrow Wilson, just really his Dick Cheney at the time, he explained the whole plot. Very soon, 
every American will be required to register their biological property, which is the birth certificate, in a national system designed to keep track of the people, and that will operate under the ancient system of pledging. By such methodology, we can compel people to submit to our agenda, which will affect our security as a chargeback for our fiat paper currency. Every American will be forced to register or suffer being unable to work and earn a living. They will be our chattel, and we will hold the security interest over them forever by operation of the law merchant under the scheme of secure transactions. Americans, by unknowingly or unwittingly delivering the bills of lading to us, will be rendered bankrupt and insolvent, forever to remain economic slaves through taxation, secured by their pledges. They will be stripped of their rights and given a commercial value designed to make us a profit. They will be none the wiser, for not one man in a million could ever figure out our plans. And if by accident one or two should figure it out, we have in our arsenal plausible deniability. After all, this is the only logical way to fund government, by floating liens and debts to the registrants in the form of benefits and privileges. This will inevitably reap us huge profits beyond our wildest expectations and leave every American a contributor to this fraud, which we will call social insurance. Without realizing it, every American will insure us for any loss we may incur in this manner. Every American will unknowingly be our servant, however begrudgingly. The people will become helpless and without any hope for their redemption, and we will employ the high office of president of our dummy corporation to foment this plot against America. Now, you can't make it any clearer than that unless you throw bleach on it. Shortly after, in 1933 to be exact, we enter the birth certificate. The definition of a certificate is evidence of something owned. So right there, that should inform you that anything with a birth certificate or a certificate in general has an owner. Also created in 1933 as a private Delaware corporation was the collection agency for the Federal Reserve Association, the Internal Revenue Tax and Audit Service, Inc., file number 03-25720, or as you know them, the IRS. They were created to ensure the payment on the debt incurred by the federal corporate government through the pledge of its corporate subject slave citizens. There is no more actual lawful government. You need to wake up and see this. What you think of as the United States of America is only a corporation. Another Delaware corporation to be exact. Well, actually, it's two different corporations. United States of America, Inc., file number 2193946, and the United States of America, Inc., file number 4525682. Don't believe me? Go to the Delaware government website, click on Entity Search, and type in these file numbers, and you can see it for yourself. They're filed in Delaware because Delaware has the most lenient corporate laws of all the 50 states. And just so you know, these aren't the only supposed government agencies that are Delaware corporations. Here are a few more. You have the CIA, which most of you think is the Central Intelligence Agency. However, their actual corporate name is the Central Intelligence Authority, Inc., file number 2004409. Then you have the United States Treasury or U.S. Treasury Inc. file number 2221617. Then you have the Federal Land Corporation file number 0897960. And I know you know this one because these are the people who insure your money with the bank. The FDIC Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Yes, they are a private Delaware corporation. File number 1003818. And you have United States of America and China Chamber of Commerce, Inc. Yes, we are linked and in business with China over here. And that file number is 3081058. Then you have United States of America Foundation. File number 7607. United States of America Fiduciary International. Get this, this is an LLC. File number 4311929. 
United States of America Corporation, which is what they were before, before they became Inc. That file number was 2025923. It is no longer a corporation, it is closed. You have the United States of America Realty Association. Yes, 2201371. Then, I know you know this, Social Security Corporation, Department of Health, Education, and Welfare Inc. Yes, your welfare checks and education are all privatized corporations from Delaware. That file number is 2213136. And trust, there are many, many more. Check it out for yourself. This is the state in which America, and the rest of the world for that matter, reside in today. A state of corporate contractual slavery and bondage, bound basically through every governmental document you have in all caps or anything with your signature on it, i.e. birth certificate, driver's license, passport, voter registration card, social security card, etc., as well as propaganda from the media, TV shows, video games, sports, and as I said earlier, religion, which literally means to bind or tie up. Please don't believe me or take my word for it. Although I am pretty trustworthy. <laughs> you need to start to acquire the books and tools you need to do your own research and discovery. Study this channel as well as others who are shining light on the information. Become aware and only then will you begin on your path to true freedom. And this is the good news. There is a path to freedom no matter what your color, your so-called race is, but it all starts with freeing your mind first. As much as we would like this to be true, everyone doesn't have a free or sovereign state of mind. Some people are natural followers and some people natural leaders. You need to figure out which are you. Will you truly study and do what it takes to free yourself of all the mental and contractual and word shackles that have been placed upon you? Or are you happy with having privileges that can be taken away instead of rights that cannot. Being told what to do, what to think, what to eat, what to study, what to wear, where you can go, and so on. One of the greatest lines from The Matrix that I rarely hear quoted amongst the rest is there's a difference between knowing the path and walking the path. Most people like to learn information to impress others and show how much they know without really putting the knowledge to the test. Now that's okay sometimes because the information gets passed on to somebody who can actually do something with it. But it's really just a form of mental masturbation. Just getting pleasure from the praise and admiration they get for what they know and not what they actually have done with it. Which one are you? In part two to this video, Contract Slavery The Way Out, I will show the different methods and remedies you have at your disposal to free yourself and your relatives, not family, from this contractual bondage you have unwittingly agreed to be placed in. And I do mean agreed to be placed in. Until then, here are a few books to get and some videos you can watch on this channel or on YouTube just in general to help you get on your way to being free. This is Real Nega, Magus9, wishing you well and good fortune on your journey. Peace and may the force be with you. Just kidding. Sort of. Not really. Oh yeah, if you have any questions or you want to share some info, please feel free to leave a comment or just post a link. Or you can leave me an email at magus189 at gmail.com. That's M-A-G-U-S 189 at gmail.com. And I'll get back ASAP. This is Magus9 once again saying, if you're going to be a nigga, be a real nigga. Peace.